My name is Amy Darius. Thank you for having me for the California Dental Association in Anaheim, California, May 2021. Um, the title of our topic is Integrative Dentistry, five topics to have, conversations to have from the dental hygiene chair or really any dental chair, any dental setting every day. I think it will change your practice. And I'm going to start today by reading a poem by David White. It's called Start Close End. And I think it really gets to the crux of the matter that I hope that you'll be able to embrace when you get back to work on Monday. Start close in. Don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first thing, close in, the step you don't want to take. Start with the ground you know, the pale ground beneath your feet, your own way to begin the conversation. Start with your own question. Give up on the other people's questions. Don't let them smother something simple. Because to hear another's voice, to follow your own voice, wait until that voice becomes a private ear that can really listen to another. Start right now. Take a small step that you can call your own. Don't follow anyone else's heroics. Be humble and focused. Start close in. Don't mistake that other voice for your own. Start close in. Don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first thing. Start close in. The step you don't want to take by David White. He's an Irish poet, but he lives in the Pacific Northwest. And he was a marine biologist before he became a poet. And I want to share that because... These conversations for you at your dental office may be new. Your patient base not, may not understand why you're talking all of a sudden with them about whole body health and how it relates to dentistry. So you may be finding yourself re-educating yourself, your team, your family, and your patients on the role of a dentist in the modern day practice. Integrative medicine is taking the world by storm. It's really a melding of Eastern and Western medicine and having a respect not only for different ideas, but also holding space for how the patient wants to be treated. It's our responsibility to understand what is going to be good science. And when a patient wants to do something to be able to, again, hold that space, respect how they want to be treated, but also be able to advise um, or know where you can go to for resources to see if that is going to be a helpful idea, a helpful healing idea when they come to you. And the dental office is such a great place to have these types of conversations because 90% of us are small businesses still in America. A lot of folks will see multiple generations of the same family, and we see the same patients year after year, potentially for decades, because we are that small family business. And a lot of folks have medical insurance that switches around from year to year, or they don't have medical insurance this year. But a lot of those patients come to us before they go for that job interview so that we can get their smile ready and help them do their best work when they go for that interview. If we can incorporate some of the ideas I'm going to present to you today, I believe we can really save our healthcare system a lot of money. Um, they have done some studies on how much money can we save. It's, it's in the billions of dollars, truly. And, you know, when we see people generation after generation, we can see trends in families. We can see um, the history and we have more time a lot of times with people and it's for a lot less cost than what a lot of people are going to spend with the doctor and the timing, that consistency of care is really key that our profession can offer. You're going to see some whole body health techniques and advice in today's lecture that I believe you'll be able to share um, with your family, your team, and with all of your patients. So the five conversations we're going to talk about today are number one, teaching good health numbers, to appreciating gene SNPs, gene SNPs, that's single nucleotide polymorphisms. Three, explain and appreciate the relationships between emotional health and dental health. Four, talk about diet and lifestyle with your patients. And five, talk about sleep and sleep appliances with your patients. These are all going to be practice builders for you. And we're going to start today with our PowerPoint here. I hope we don't have death by PowerPoint today. It's really important that this is a helpful conversation for you and an exciting conversation. It's the future of the dental business, I believe. So I did an integrative medicine fellowship a few years ago with AIHM, which is located out of San Diego, um, Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine, and they do allow dentists in their two-year integrative medicine fellowship. For those of you who want a lot more detail, um, similar background to what I've been able to study, um, that's a good resource. Um, but I have no uh, monetary affiliation with them. I just, I just think they do a great job. Um, so an integrative approach to dentistry, connecting whole body health and the dental hygiene chair. And we're going to briefly talk about some of the connections that you all might already be aware of about how 
oral health is related to, to systemic health. And then we're going to get into the meat of these five conversations. We know that the mouth is part of the gut and about half of the bacteria in the mouth is really found throughout the gut. And when the mouth is inflamed, it's really a window into the overall health of the body, just as the eyes are the window to the soul. And most systemic diseases do indeed have visible signs in the mouth. Most vitamin nutrition deficiencies also have oral signs and symptoms, which we're going to cover today. And I really wanted to touch on three of the most commonly found chronic disease processes we see in our populations, heart disease, diabetes, and kidney disease. But these a lot of times have a foundation of a long history, a longstanding history of years and years of gut dysbiosis, gut inflammation that we can also pick up on in the mouth. And let's talk about the oral microflora. When we have metabolic syndrome, it's when we have any three of these five out of these five symptoms, we, we are considered to have metabolic syndrome. Some people call it syndrome X in the medical community. Um, abdominal obesity, elevated blood fats or triglycerides, um, low HDL. Some people call that good cholesterol. H HDLs are the high density lipoproteins that help act as scavengers in our bloodstream and pick up and get rid of toxins and things you don't want floating around your bloodstream. Um, when we have low amounts of that, we're more prone to develop metabolic, metabolic syndrome. When we have elevated blood pressure and the blood pressure standard has actually gone from being considered high if you're over 120 over 90 to 110 over 80. So our standards of what we realize are going to be helpful for the long-term health of a patient are changing. So knowing good blood, good numbers are going to be helpful. Um, understanding the effects of elevated blood sugar. And this is something else that you can look for in the dental chair very easily when you have a patient with bleeding gums. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But the seed of all these chronic disease processes really lies in the gut where about 90% of our immune system cells are. And we have been familiar with the fact, if you have an apple or a pear figure that might set you up differently, folks that have more of an apple shaped or in, in other words, visceral or, or belly fat, they are more likely to develop metabolic syndrome if this is where they put on their weight um, versus a pear shaped figure. Waistlines, therefore, of men over 40 inches and women over 35 inches are uh, an indicator of this um, visceral body fat. But you can also have um, skinny fat, or in other words, sarcopenic obesity, where somebody looks skinny, but that doesn't mean that they don't have these elevated triglycerides or low HDLs or blood pressure issues or high blood sugar issues. So it's still appropriate to know what the good healthcare numbers are and not just judge somebody based on their, on their body type. Um, the microflora of the body, again, 50% of what's in the gut is found in the mouth. Those really influence, um, how we process these process fats and sugars. Um, they even process what we might want to, or influence how we want to eat or what types of foods we're craving. And they influence, um, how we're going to think about a lot of things. So we have actually some meta, some medical research that supports what they call the old friends hypotheses. When we build up better um, types of bacteria or certain strains of bacteria, we are less likely to develop chronic disease because we have been in symbiosis, a symbiotic relationship with these for millennia. And when we start developing oral problems such as gum disease or cavities, this is where we're starting to see that dysbiosis happen in the dental, in the dental practice. And these dysbioses are these, uh, the absence of the better types of bacteria. It's like having gangs move in to your mouth and to your whole uh, GI tract. And the things that influence that oftentimes occur with these chemical chemical changes or dietary choices. When we have more, um, sugar intake, alcohol intake, or the consumption of a lot of our grains that we've grown with weed killer, um, those have influenced how our gut changes and who seems to survive living in our gut for every 10 bacteria cells that we have in our body. We only have one human cell. So it's not about what we've realized is it's not about killing off all the bacteria in our bodies anymore. It's about how do we promote the growth of the better bacteria because somebody's going to be living with us inside of us. And so how do we get our friends to live inside of us? 
When we have an absence of our better friends in terms of bacteria, we are going to see an increase in inflammatory chemicals such as C-reactive protein and interleukin-6. And these types of chemicals can, process, can be floating around our bloodstream literally for years. And they can actually have been um, attributed in the medical research to even contribute towards people suffering from depression years and years and some later. And sometimes these can also be caused by emotional upset. So later in this lecture and these good health conversations, you're going to see how adverse childhood experiences seem to um, influence the, the development of these chemicals, the circulating of these chemicals in our body. Meanwhile, what we are realizing from medical research is that we have a, a huge increase in autoimmune disorders that are happening. This also happens from leaky gut or this dysbiosis happening in the gut where the tight junctions in the small intestinal walls start to break down and allow a, from the passage of the intestines into the bloodstream, um, certain bacterial parts uh, the, and some of these inflammatory chemicals such as C-reactive proteins and interleukin-6. And there's other chemicals too, but those are some of the more well-studied chemicals. And we're seeing with that an increase in these autoimmune disorders like asthma, diabetes, Crohn's disease, and multiple sclerosis amongst others. Parkinson's is another one. And some cardiologists will even tell you nowadays that they are considering heart disease as even a manifestation of autoimmune disease. So this is a little diagram up here in our uh, PowerPoint showing kind of a uh, an example of how that leaky gut process happens. And then this is our cycle of what happens as the intestines becomes more and more inflamed from inflammatory chemicals, because we're not, uh, we don't have enough of our old friends living inside of us. We start absorbing nutrients poorer and poorer, more poorly, and we develop an immune system response to that. We have more and more gut upset. 20% of our American population now has IBS, irritable bowel syndrome types of symptoms. Um, some of those develop into more serious problems long-term like celiac disease or even Crohn's. Crohn's does have a genetic um, background or, or um, link to it. And we have linked these directly to the um, consumption of wheat, corn, dairy, sugar, alcohol, ibuprofen, overuse of non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, processed foods, um, the use of antibiotics and bacterial or yeast overgrowth. And this is a big problem. So we're starting to see links, commonalities, um, in these inflammatory chemicals between things like periodontal disease and rheumatoid arthritis. And we're seeing connections with this poor uh, vitamin absorption because the bacteria in your gut influence how you're going to absorb vitamins. So we are realizing that the, when you're look, when you're developing a lot of dental cavities, you're oftentimes low in vitamin D, vitamin A, vitamin K2, and your calcium phosphorus ratio. The best way to get more phosphorus in you is sunlight. And we're also seeing that the involvement of um, this, the serum and um, when you have a celiac problem or a gluten sensitivity, it actually in children can affect the development of enamel. So when we see long-term gluten exposure, um, we are more likely to see enamel defects in children, hypoplasia. And this very likely is mostly attributed to the toxins that are in our food supply. And this is showing the um, process or the correlation between the use of glyphosate and incidence of celiac disease. Glyphosate's a weed killer. Some people call it Roundup. That's one of the brand names of it. And then this is the prevalence of diabetes um, plotted against the usage of glyphosate and corn and soy in the United States over the last couple of decades. And then where you see the darker colors on these maps of the United States, the darker colors represent on the left, um, the states where you have higher percentages of obesity. And on the right, it's the percentage of, or the higher concentrations of antibiotic prescriptions written. So we're seeing this, um, the change as we change the oral and gut microbiome, which is going to happen through antibiotic usage, we're seeing a correlation with obesity trends. It takes literally years after a round of antibiotics some people say between two and 10 years to reestablish the gut flora in the intestines. So 
Thank goodness um, we're becoming more and more aware of this. Groups like the American Dental Association has now mandated um, being a lot more careful and strict about when we want to prescribe antibiotics for dental pain and swelling. And the best advice is going to be to, to explain to your patient why we don't want to write so many antibiotic prescriptions. Not only that, we don't really have a lot more antibiotics in our pipeline. It takes years to develop antibiotics and bring them to the market. And there's really none others. We're, we're seeing so much antibiotic resistance and we've used them so often for a long time and, and we haven't come up with any others. And we're, we're really hurting ourselves for a very long time. So we really want to encourage immediate attention, get that, get that dental infection taken care of straight away. When we can control these gut problems, um, we can really reduce our rates of heart disease, diabetes, and kidney troubles. Um, these days from the medical community, the best way to judge if you're going to develop cardiovascular disease is to have a test done called the endothelial progenitor cell count. This is the standard of care in Europe. And it's something you may need to ask your cardiologist about, or your doctor about when you're having labs done. Another sign and symptom of somebody who's very likely to develop heart disease is a wrinkle in the earlobe. So that's something that's easily witnessed from the dental chair. Most of the damage to your heart vessels occurs within 10 minutes after a meal, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, and what we're seeing when we're developing cardiovascular disease is we're seeing an imbalance. Um, we're seeing greater amounts of toxins circulating in the bloodstream and free radical overload. We're seeing greater amounts of overall inflammation in the body. Again, from the mouth is a, is a common place. We're seeing inflammation in the blood vessels and kidneys and overall autoimmune dysfunction, which is why a lot of the cardiologists are starting to think about cardiovascular disease as an autoimmune condition. And this is where I like to talk about or ask questions about the nitric oxide pathway. Now I'll tell you what, I had not heard of the nitric oxide pathway until about seven or eight years ago, but it actually won the Nobel prize for medicine back in the mid 1990s. And it has literally hundreds of uses in the body. These are my I call it the top seven uses of nitric oxide in the body. This is different from laughing gas. Laughing gas is nitrous oxide, but this is nitric oxide. And it is the most powerful vasodilator in the body. It prevents atherosclerosis because it prevents adhesions to the uh, blood vessel cell walls, the endothelium. It is a major role player in remodeling the blood vessels. It creates renal vasodilation, dilation. In other words, better kidney function controls T cell immune response, reducing inflammation, influencing inflammation and reducing it. It also um, prevents and creates a better ratio of HDL to LDLs. In other words, that good cholesterol to bad cholesterol ratios improve when you have enough nitric oxide being made by the body and it promotes appropriate cell death, apoptosis. After the age of 40, Mouth, uh, mouthwash and proton pump inhibitors. In other words, um, um, the purple pill, uh, peptide, um, uh, things for indigestion medicines for indigestion and mouthwashes can actually really greatly reduce our ability to make nitric oxide. And this is the nitric oxide pathway. That's primarily in force in our body after the age of 40, before age 40, there's two ways our bodies make nitric oxide. One is called the L arginine pathway. And it uses a chemical called nitric oxide synthase, an enzyme. And the other way is by eating a lot more green leafy vegetables, which you're going to see a lot of today when we talk about diet. Um, and when we chew food in our mouth, the bacteria in our mouth convert nitrates from the spinach or green leafy vegetables to nitrites. But when we take a maprazole or other types of uh, uh, medicines that can reduce our gastric acid or stomach acid, it, it also cuts down on how we can reduce the nitrates or nitrates to nitric oxide. That's one of the places it takes place. They estimate that by killing off um, the bacteria in our mouth, we may be affecting our ability to make nitric oxide by about 40%. And this actually gets recirculated. So when we are a bad maker of nitric oxide, we're actually also a lot more likely to develop Sjogren's syndrome because um, a lot of the nitric oxide gets recirculated back to the salivary glands. And a lot of it's also stored in the maxillary sinus. So when you're talking about oral appliances for sleep, 
And if you can help grow or develop the face better, you may be able to grow more of a sinus cavity that can house more of this nitric oxide. Being a gas, it has to be made every 0.1 milliseconds. You have to constantly make this to be able to create enough um, to do your body the best. And this is something we test for in our dental office. There are these little strips you can buy, um, very inexpensive, and you have a patient spit on the strip and it should turn bright red. If you want to know, I mentioned green leafy vegetables, but watermelons, another good food and beets are a good food to help you make nitric oxide. And also interestingly enough, um, vegetables that are grown organically, sometimes while they aren't grown with pesticides, that's what it means to be grown organically. They actually may have, because they haven't used fertilizer, they may actually be lower in the nitrites to help you or nitrates to help you make nitric oxide. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and this was a study done in part by Duke University. And they found that the uses of mouthwashes could affect your nitric oxide making ability for up to six hours after, after usage. And that this is directly related, related to blood pressure management. The, if you can make good nitric oxide, some, some people are able to really help out their blood, high blood pressure issue. So, um, I did a little podcast for a while and called the whole healing radio show. And I interviewed Nathan Bryan, who is the, uh, really the go-to guy in the medical community about nitric oxide. And, um, I'm going to show you a little snippet from this friend and colleague, and he does a great job. And as a cardiologist teaches people about endothelial dysfunction and and nitric oxide. In fact, he's conducted many of the clinical trials on our technology. Um, but yeah, he does a great job. In fact, we we can discuss it later, but I think we figured out the oral systemic link. We know that people with periodontal disease, gingivitis have a higher incidence of heart attack and stroke, and we may understand why now. Well, can we talk a little bit about that? Can we start with the mouthwash part maybe of nitric oxide? Sure. So for years, you know, people thought that, you know, this increased inflammation in the gums and uh, you know, in the in the oral cavity was causing systemic inflammation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's still an important piece of the puzzle. But what we're finding is, so there's two components here. Number one is the people that have periodontal disease are typically told by their dentist to use mouthwash to kill these uh, gingival plaque that are causing the the inflammation and the gum disease. Well, indiscriminately, these the, the antiseptics are killing the good bacteria. And so we've identified some non-pathogenic commensal oral bacteria that are basically providing the human body with a source of nitric oxide. So when you use mouthwash, you kill about 50% of the body's ability to generate nitric oxide. Mm -hmm. And nitric oxide is one of these molecules that's cardioprotective. It maintains normal blood pressure. It maintains a clean lining of the blood vessel to where plaque and fat doesn't uh, deposit and accumulate. And uh, so when you lose the ability to make nitric oxide, you get advanced cardiovascular disease. But that's so that's one part of the story. The other side of the story is that, you know, there's a lot of bacteria in the mouth and they're all competing for limited resources. And when you've got some pathogens, such as the gingival bacteria that are causing the plaque and the gum disease, mm -hmm. they're ba basically out competing the good bacteria that are generating nitric oxide. So the whole point is, is that focusing on the oral microbiome and oral health is probably one of the most important things you can do for maintaining cardiovascular health. That's, that's a good, that so I just wanted to share that. That's a perspective of, of, uh, of Dr. Nathan Bryan. He's a PhD. He's a professor and inventor. He'd done a ton of research on this pathway and it won the Nobel prize for medicine in the 1990s. And I don't have all the answers about or regimens at all about who all, when do we suggest people use my mouthwash, but it's something that we need to understand in the medical community is being discussed from a different standpoint. And I just, I'm here sometimes to ask the questions, not to have all the answers, but it's, it's a teaching moment for us, or it was for me as a dentist about who and when to um, use mouthwash. It's, I'm, so I've changed how I recommend that a little bit. Um, this is a study you may have seen um, out of Finland uh, on 101 patients who had passed away from heart attacks. And they found that, uh, you know, bacteria that are specific to causing cavities or gum disease were responsible for the heart attacks. So clearly we found that we're getting um, a circulation of probably through this inflammation pathway um, of, of mouth bacteria into the heart. And we're just going to keep moving along. 
Um, we also realized that with diabetes, we've got twice as many cases of diabetes than we did 20 years ago. We're um, at 19.7% of the population is now pre-diabetic and they estimate by 2030, it'll be almost a third of the US population. These maps on the lower right hand of your screen, the darker the state um, of the United States um, maps, that's the higher the prevalence of diabetes. So you can see as the years are progressing from 1994 to 2015, we are getting more and more states where we have many, many cases of diabetes. And again, when you correlate that with where we're using antibiotics, it's, it's really interesting and eye-opening uh, to see where you see the darker states, higher numbers of prescriptions for antibiotics and higher cases of diabetes. And we understand that there's protocols um, for dentists and correlations with diet and lifestyle for diabetes. I don't wanna harp on that so much today because we wanna have these five new conversations. Some of this I believe is review, but I still wanted to touch on it. Um, I could really stop, talk for hours and hours, but we, we wanna keep this alive and moving here. So um, I will say the American Diabetes Association has linked uh, that there's actually fatty acid changes, there's changes in inflammation in the blood, in the bloodstream years and years before you get the diagnosis of diabetes. So all of these things link back to who's living in us. Again, there's 10 bacteria cells for every human cell. Risk factors, we realize, you know, being sedentary, certain ethnicities, um, history of hypertension, you know, combine these, you, you develop insulin resistance and get diabetes. And there are, there is an, an ADA code, uh, D0411, to do HbA1c testing in your office. It was new back in 2018. Um, you can even develop or buy some different um, equipment to test for diabetes. A really inexpensive way to test for diabetes in your office is when you have a patient who has gum inflammation, they're bleeding, they're already, there's already blood, there's exudate on your instruments. You can actually dip that uh, or have a, a disposable dipstick and dip it into one of these little contraptions. Um, it's, it's relatively inexpensive and the dipsticks are pennies on the dollar. Um, and you can give the patient a reading, um, of, of what their blood sugar level is. So it's, it's, it doesn't take long to do. Um, and it's really an informative way. We can be a dot connector in the dental office for overall health conditions. And you know what, when, when you start having these conversations with people and you connect the dots for them, they really appreciate it. You're looking out for them. They're going to value coming into the dentist and it's your practice is going to grow. That's what I believe you're going to see. We also realized that only about 19% of people that have um, chronic kidney disease know that they have it. And a lot of those patients, almost 40% of them already have diabetes. So kidney disease is another manifestation of when you have a gut microbiome, an oral microbiome that's been out of whack for a long time, and you develop chronic kidney disease or a chronic disease process that ultimately you'll probably pass away from a lot of these people with chronic kidney failure, um, are on dialysis. They should be on dialysis in the dental office. There is a protocol where we see them the next day after they've had dialysis. Oftentimes they have been, um, on an antibiotic, uh, um, therapy before they come in and they oftentimes have different oral manifestations that point to chronic inflammation, TMJ issues, a swollen tongue, mouth ulcers, metallic taste, dry mouth. They're, they're having a lot of trouble. And so we want to see them the day after dialysis. They may be on antibiotics before the dental treatment work with their physician. And a lot of times their calcium and phosphorus levels are low as you would have if you had cavities. And so again, just to sum up, we, we see there's a lot of chronic disease processes that have been linked to gut microflora, and so that's why the feature of dentistry in my mind is to have these five dental conversations, teaching good healthcare numbers, appreciating gene S and P's explain and appreciate relationships between emotional health and dental health, talking about diet and lifestyle and talking about sleep with your patient. All of these are going to be linked to conversations about how to have better oral health. So if you print out our handout, we have a lot of these graphs coming up and the handout, they can be used as a reference page or pages, I should say, for your office. But having a familiarity with what is current in terms of numbers, as I mentioned, for example, high blood pressure used to be 120 systolic over 90 diastolic, and they've lowered that in the medical community to 110 over 80 as the ideal standard. And 
We talked about uh, diabetes testing um, and the waistline for men and women for diabetes. If they've not eaten and they're seeing being seen early in the morning, you want to see a number listed of less than 5.7% or fasting blood sugar of less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. Um, there are other standards if they've eaten in the last couple of hours before you see them, but having an awareness of those good healthcare numbers is going to help you inform the patient, Hey, you're inching up on this. Do you realize this is connected? This diet pre being pre-diabetic is certainly connected to oral inflammation. And when you connect these things and help that patient get the real control over their overall health, your dental work is going to hold up that scaling and root planning is going to hold up and they're going to keep coming back because they value that you cared for them to have this conversation. Um, being able to read a basic blood test is also helpful. So understanding that the so-called good cholesterol, the scavenger cholesterol, the HDLs, um, you want those numbers above 40 milligrams per deciliter and above 50 for women. Um, also knowing vitamin D levels, you want at least 30 nanograms per deciliter on a blood test for vitamin D. But if you had seven, a range of 70 to hundred, that's a lot better. Um, total cholesterol still less than 200 milligrams per deciliter. So being able to measure in the chair, um, if they make good nitric oxide, what their blood sugar levels are having a conversations about with them about, have you had blood testing done any time in the last couple of years, encouraging them to get tested so that they can be measured, explaining the oral systemic connection to patients is helpful. And then instruct now, what can you do about it? Offering solutions. Um, one of the things I'd recommend too, is offering a resource page for your community, for people know, maybe some of the physicians in your area, it can be a cross referral source, a really great business move to become more established, especially if you're a new dentist in town, to let people know what you're offering in your practice. So the next conversation I want to have with you is about talking about gene SNPs. And this is a complicated conversation potentially, and you could really spend hours and hours. And I hope you might be inspired by this snippet in this, um, in this lecture today about gene SNPs. Um, this is a diagram that I, I made um, to try to simplify this conversation to make it a little bit more memorable, perhaps. Um, you might remember from high school biology, you had something called the Krebs cycle. And it seems like after you get out of biology, basic biology, you don't ever talk about it again in terms of health. But um, Krebs cycle is over here on the far left. And you might notice all of these sort of cogs. They're sort of like the inside of a clock or the inside of an old x-ray developer. And each wheel helps to turn the wheel next to it. And the path of these wheels really starts on the right side of, the of, of this table, so to speak here, this diagram with this one that where you see SAM E and MTR and MTRR. And when this wheel gets turned, it helps reduce the level of homocysteine, which is an inflammatory chemical. And when this turns, you're able to create and absorb these other vitamins like vitamin B9, folic acid, vitamin B12, zinc, vitamin C. And again, you see this so-called SAM E, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, you can have be tested with either a salivary or a blood test for how well you make this enzyme called MTHFR. In other words, it's also called metratetrahydrofolic reductase. And now you might know why we call it MTHFR. Some people refer to it as mother, father gene. Um, of course you get all of your genes from your mom and your dad, but we call it MTHFR as, as an acronym. And, um, I have a psychiatrist patient that is always joking around. And he's like, well, Amy, you know, they don't call it when you have it, they don't call it MTHFR. They call it some, I would, they refer to it as something else. Right. And he chuckles. So hopefully you get that little joke, but, um, you can test for this with a salivary and blood test, you cannot test for biopteron with a salivary or blood test, but this um, MTHFR enzyme wheel turns this metabolic process for biopterin, which turns the nitric oxide pathway, which directly turns the Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle is how we make our basic energy blocks, ATP. And when we die, we continue to make ATP for about 48 hours, which is why we get rigor mortis. And then once we've exhausted all of our sources of ATP, we, we become limp again as a corpse. Um, but what we're seeing are connections between energy, sleep and health issues and vitamin absorption. 
when these enzyme pathways are working well, we function well, we feel great. We have high energy because we're making good ATP. But when some of these wheels turn sluggishly, it can be because we don't have the ability to make enough of the enzymes. And that could be a genetic issue. And these genetic issues can get ramped up or down with lifestyle. So that's why they're referred to as gene um, polymorphisms. Um, they can be influenced by lifestyle, which is why you could have tw identical twins that are genetically identical and everyone mixes them up when they're young, but as they get older, one likes to run marathons and one likes to watch television and never exercises and gets to be obese, or maybe has a lot of uh, depression or has some trauma. They've been, been in a bad car accident and they start to look really different. They have still the same genetic profile, but some of the genes have gotten amped up or woken up. And through better lifestyle choices, um, particularly proper exercise and care to the body, we can tap down these or, or um, decrease the influence that these genes can hold over our lives. When you're low on this metrotetrahydrofolic reductase, we have um, our immunity suffers. We're not able to detox very well. We're more likely to develop shingles as a younger person, um, gum disease, periodontal disease, um, our offspring can, um, or is more likely to have a high steep palate, a narrow palate. We also don't process nitrous oxide, laughing gas very well because it depletes us of where we're already having a hard time absorbing vitamin B6 and B12 and B9. So, um, folks that have, again, we could talk about these gene SNP pathways for a long time, but I wanted to talk about MTHFR in particular because of the connection with laughing gas, maybe not being the greatest choice to manage anxiety for those folks. And it's connected to so many, so many health problems. It's the most highly studied gene SNP. And there's really two major manifestations of MTHFR, although there are others. One is called the A1298C and the other pathway is called the C677 pathway. The, MT, the A1298C pathway um, it creates, um, a, you have an imbalance of homocysteine levels, this inflammation level. And we see folks with a family history, which is why it's helpful to see multiple generations in a practice um, of diabetes, um, heart disease, kidney troubles. And when we see more of the manifestation of the C677, we see more cases of spina bifida, schizophrenia, depression. Um, we see thyroid problems with both, with both uh, groups. Um, so, you know, you'll see these people, we have people call our office. Now they've become aware through the time and time magazine invention of the year from about 15 years ago called 23 and me, um, or they've been tested by their doctor and they may be taking a lot of supplements. So I want you to have an understanding of why they're concerned. Um, they want to know what you're going to do because they have MTHFR. So I want you to be familiar with what that is. Um, because they're concerned. They've, they've usually suffered some health issues. They've gone and gotten tested to get to the bottom of their rabbit hole and they want you to be able to support them. So you want to really talk with them about keeping their inflammation down. Uh, we send home people with a grocery list a lot of times. So when they have MTHFR, um, it's about half the population, whether they're heterozygous one parent, or they have the gene from both parents, homozygous. We send them home with um, a methylated folic acid uh, methylated, uh, vitamin B12 has a cobalt atom attached to it. So th that means that they've, um, chemically added what the enzyme would have done if that person made enough of, of that MTHFR metro tetrahydrofolic reductase. And so it's, it's comes, it's almost like pre-digested. It's, um, it comes in a form that they can absorb because when they, if they're homozygous, for instance, for a 1298C version, they eat a big bowl of spinach. And they will only absorb about 20% of the vitamin B12 and the folic acid that's in there. So they're just always a little bit undernourished. They can't, they just can't absorb it. So you're helping them absorb those vitamins. Also taking more riboflavin, vitamin B2, vitamin C and zinc is helpful. Um, some of those people uh, tend to have higher loads of heavy metals. Um, so if you want to talk about mercury, some of them are worried about mercury when they have, um, uh, they're homozygous, for instance, for that A1298C, and they get any dosage of something with mercury, be it from food or maybe um, old amalgams. Uh, if there's anything removed that they ingest, 
they're, they only are going to detox about 20% of it easily because they just, they're just always low. A lot of those people are running tired. So this is my um, Shutterstock image of an MTHFR patient, uh, somebody who's going to be addicted to caffeine, dark chocolate. They've just got to have a lot of sleep. Um, and this really starts to hit about middle age. Cause remember that MTHFR pathway helps to eventually turn that nitric oxide pathway and make ATP. So vitamins really help. Another highly studied pathway is COMT. And a lot of those patients, let's go back to the diagram for just a second with um, COMT. You'll see that over here which is a spinoff of the MTHFR pathway. The people with the COMT, a lot of times they have stress intolerance, anxiety, insomnia, allergic tendencies, and IBS. Um, they also build up more estrogen, especially after perimenopause, menopause, and they're more likely to develop breast cancer, which is about half of women in the United States now. So um, more and more people are interested in finding out through a blood test or a salivary test, if they are COMT and if they're homo or as heterozygous, um, autoimmune disease is a common manifestation of COMT. It could be Sjogren's syndrome. I wrote fibromyalgia on this. Um, supporting those people again through supplements like Sam E, which is like a natural sort of antidepressant, but it supports mood. You'll also see a lot of these people that are COMT have a hard time letting go of things. So they might hold grudges. That's an emotional component of these, which is kind of interesting. Taking magnesium, vitamin D, um, and acetylcysteine, and these can all help manage their moods and, and support and lower inflammation um, because you're helping to throw off that homocysteine imbalance that can, can be pre-existing. Um, there's other pathways like MAOA, MAOB. These are people that don't process um, sulfur in foods very well, more of a tendency to have curly hair, and they're more likely to fight depression and not sleep well. So, you know, you have people that um, don't sleep well in your practice and maybe they should wear a night guard because they're grinding, but maybe they have these pre-existing gene snips. So you can start putting together a package of who really is in front of you and how can you best support? Cause you just, if they're going to invest money in some of these things, you want to make sure that you're really supporting what they, what they have. So, um, you know, here's another person that doesn't make nitric oxide very well and they have MTHFR. So, you know, a solution for some of these people are going to be maybe taking Neo 40 tablets as an over the counter for, for gene. Um, if you don't make nitric oxide well, or encourage them to eat more green leafy vegetables, but that guy is MTHFR. So he might do well to also supplement with a vitamin B complex. That's methylated vitamin C and also zinc. So this is where, you know, if you're, you're instructing and you're telling people how they can support themselves, they're going to remember that and come in to see you. Um, talking about diet and lifestyle with people is, is very helpful. Um, I wanted to take a minute here and talk about how we used to eat versus how we eat nowadays, how we used to eat. Some people call it the paleo diet, which is a little bit, um, slick, I guess, but traditionally caveman, what we realize is they ate a lot more protein than we do in modern diet, standard, standard American diet, modern diet. They, um, had fewer carbs than Americans typically eat and they had lower fats. It was lean fat. Um, the meats of that time wouldn't have been, um, pumped up with, um, uh, a lot of chemicals and the wild animals would have been free range. Um, so what we see is even today when you're eating wild game versus, um, grain fed cows, for example, um, you almost are eating a different species in terms of the fat content. So the top line here is saturated fat, then monounsaturated fatty acids and polyunsaturated fatty acids. So we want to eat lean meat. Um, but you'll notice that you really are what you eat and that, this applies also to fish, even though fish isn't listed on here, but grass fed or wild caught meats and fish will have a different fat composition from grain or farm meats. 
We also want to talk to people about how to repopulate their body with the better types of bacteria from prebiotics, which are the foods that help build a playground for the type of bacteria that you want to live in you, and then seeding your gut with probiotic foods or taking a probiotic. The probiotics actually have the bacteria that you want living inside you in the foods. And then having an awareness of the different types of diets, DASH diet, dietary approaches to stop hypertension. Bottom line is you're eating more whole, whole foods, vegetables and grain, um, grains next, vegetables and fruits first, grains next, and you have fewer and fewer servings of fats and sweets. And then in contrast, it's similar, but a little bit different to, from the Mediterranean diet. One of the big studies done on Mediterranean diet it was the lion heart study, which was supposed to go on for many years, but after four years, they stopped the study because they had a 70% reduction in people that died of heart attacks when they uh, tried to stick with a Mediterranean diet. One thing missing on this diagram of the Mediterranean diet, which is a huge component is that we're not supposed to be alone. Um, and on time on a lot of diagrams of the Mediterranean diet, you'll see um, a lot of people listed, or it's like, you'll see gatherings of people listed. So taking time to eat, really spending, um, and focusing on the food before you eating fresh foods that they're going to carry higher energy and you're going to feel better when you see somebody, if they can spit into a cup and you see, um, exudate dripping down, um, into the, into a cup of water, um, spit that sort of hangs down and the cup of water is suspended. That's a lot of times, um, a sign of yeast infection. If they have a white coating on their tongue that scrapes off, that's a sign of yeast overgrowth. And those people might do better to be on an anti-candida diet where they're eating more foods that have higher contents of protein versus higher grains that can cause more dysbiosis grains and sugars. A lot of people like power foods, everything's in moderation, but if you want just an instant list of what are good foods to eat generally for most people, this would be that list right here. And then I want to talk about nutritional deficiencies that you can see in the, um, in the United States population. Some estimates are that about 68 to I've seen studies that say 85% of Americans are low, for instance, on magnesium. So they may be eating well, but our soils are somewhat depleted. And so a lot of folks are going to benefit by taking some supplements or being more um, aware of where they're going to get nutrition value from their foods and choosing higher quality foods. I like the idea of choosing higher quality foods because too, that's going to help drive up demand and hopefully will drive the supply chain to meet that demand for healthier foods and organic um, foods grown without uh, as many chemicals that cause dysbiosis. Oh, I wanted to point out one more thing about, about that. Um, and that is that uh, with that diagram, they've in the last couple of years, they've actually upped the iodine content. I don't see iodine on our list here, but um, you'll see that prenatal vitamins are higher, uh, in, in iodine content than they used to be. And that's very helpful because it helps the developing brain of a fetus. And it also is, uh, a lot of Americans are low in iodine because we're, we've also switched to sea salt. We don't eat a lot of sea vegetables or, or fish that contain iodine naturally. And that's really needed for our thyroid. We have a third of our population on thyroid medicine. So we want to um, provide more iodine for the thyroid and uh, gonad tissue in our bodies. Um, we also have 20% of our young ladies these days that have polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS. And um, taking an iodine supplement is a good way to help prevent that. Um, this diagram here shows where we have our vitamins absorbed in our gut. So when you take pharmaceuticals, certain pharmaceuticals can block the vitamin absorption. So for example, when you're on metformin, it can contribute, especially within a month to an inability to you'll, you will within a month have used up your magnesium storage. And you'll also have a hard time absorbing iron in your diet and vitamin B12. So if you have somebody who has MTHFR, um, they're low in energy, they have diabetes or on metformin, um, and they're grinding their teeth a lot, 
you know, they're very likely low in magnesium, which is going to help relax the body. So one of the advice advice pieces that we give our patients is considering taking what I call the $8 solution where they go take magnesium, they buy magnesium over the counter, or they take Epsom salts baths. Um, magnesium can also be, um, delivered through the skin in a cream. Um, but be aware that if they are on metformin, they, they can't absorb it through their stomach very well. And so we need to help them find, or mention to them, you know, another reason that maybe start eating differently to see if they can control their diabetes through diet. So they get proper vitamin absorption. Again, it's going to have a dental manifestation and a benefit to that overall. That's just an example of, of why we talk about vitamins with patients. So the, we're going to go over certain vitamins now and their, their benefits and what you'll see clinically as a dentist or in the, on the dental team. Um, also, I just wanted to get into, you know, we have so many people on birth control. I have no problem ethically with birth control. It's, but what it's about is, um, the reason when they say to wait, to try to get pregnant after you've gotten off birth control, it's because the birth control medicines which is a lot of people don't realize they deplete you of a lot of your vitamin B. So B1, B2, thiamine, riboflavin, B6, B9, folic acid, in other words, B12, vitamin C and zinc. So consider somebody who has MTHFR, they've been on birth control for a long time. There's a likelihood they're going to be pretty emotional people. They might be more stressed out in your chair. Even they may be running wired and tired. So, um, you know, bringing an awareness to this, they might supplement with some extra Bs if they're on, um, a birth control supplement that could maybe help them out a lot. And it also can birth control can also put you, um, at an, you know, an imbalance of other vitamins because the vitamins are synergistic. They affect each other and correlate one absorbs different from the other. And they, they are related to one another. So, um, if you have people that have heart trouble, they may very well be on heart medicines. And so we have here, this is in the handout that you get. If you print it out, um, we have the types of drugs, what they're used for common brand names and the nutrients that they deplete you of. So these are the so-called side effects, or sometimes the reasons you have side effects with some of these pharmaceuticals. So for example, if I have somebody taking a beta blocker, a really common um, I recommend that they take CoQ10, particularly after age 40, chromium and melatonin. And by the way, a lot of the medicines people don't start taking until after age 40. And they believe that nitric oxide is one of the reasons why chronic disease starts to happen because one of those pathways to make chronic, uh, nitric oxide shuts down after age 40. And then we're dependent on the microflora and the body. So we're going to keep moving along here. Uh, I told you we'd be looking at uh, dental clinical signs of vitamin deficiencies. Uh, one of the most common ones is you'll see scalloping on the tongue. Uh, could be from dry mouth, could be from um, overall uh, gastrointestinal inflammation or underactive thyroid where the, um, or even an underdevelopment of the face. Uh, so the tongue is almost too big for the mouth. And, uh, but it could also be a vitamin B12 deficiency. Other signs and symptoms of the face. We talked about the earlobe earlier, but you could also have um, a blowing up of the infraorbital area under the eye area. And that's a chronic sign of, of inflammation and swelling. Um, here's that earlobe again. Also, if you have xanthalasma, those are those little yellow deposits in the eye. So these people ask them, are, are you seeing a doctor? You may need to see a doctor because there are potentially some signs and symptoms I'm seeing here that there may be something to know about that. So if you haven't been in a while, you, you can just gently encourage people to, to see their doctor and get, get routine blood testing done. Um, for those people that have chronic um, disease processes going on, cardiovascular disease symptoms, kidney disease problems, or diabetes, um, you, you know that you can support them with various supplements. This is also in your handout. So for example, fish oil, um, you want to select one that's higher in EPA fatty acids versus DHA. That's how you consider one high quality. So buy a brand that where it's listed on there and you take a higher dosage to be therapeutic. But I've had people come back when they get on a slightly higher dosage of maybe two to four capsules a day. And they've really, they've got to get a blood test and they've really turned around their cholesterol levels. They have much higher HDLs um, and, and lower LDLs and their blood pressure has really greatly reduced. 
The only vitamin B with an upper limit is vitamin B3, also called niacin. It's a great way they've studied to help prevent additional skin cancer. So they've done a study in airline pilots. They have a higher rate of skin cancer. Um, and you want to do a limit of, of less than 25 milligrams a day. But my favorite supplements, vitamin supplements for heart disease are, are these. So we talked about CoQ10 and fish oil, vitamin D3, B complex, vitamin C, magnesium, zinc, and of course, taking probiotics that set the stage for, for who's living in you and how you absorb your fats and sugars. CoQ10 is really especially helpful after age 40 for um, circulation of the extremities. They help prevent, it prevents cardiac arrhythmias and depression, impotence, and high blood sugar levels. We talked about fish oil just now. You want to select a brand. Um, and some of you may want to include supplements in your practice. It could be another practice builder um, selling supplements, having a drugstore in your practice, but um, EPA to DHA. And uh, something to note, um, you're more likely to have higher amounts of tartar buildup on especially the lower anterior teeth when you're low in vitamin D and you want a level that's at least 70 nanograms per deciliter. And um, one of the signs and symptoms on an x-ray is when you see the pulp chamber look more like a chair than an, a regular pulp chamber. Um, in the medical community, they actually have done research and they say that's actually a sign of chronic low vitamin D levels. And a lot of us in the northern most of us in the northern hemisphere are a little bit low. And how much vitamin D to advise somebody to take? Well, it really needs to be conferred by a blood test. What the best amount is, but when you're seeing a lot of tartar on the lower anterior teeth, um, and they're they're just kind of they you ask them and they're tired. I would recommend that um, you start with two to three thousand units a day. They can be delivered with a little oral spray, and I like uh, brands that come with some K2 mixed in that keeps the vitamin D um, from circulating um, with calcium in your uh, bloodstream, which can cause atherosclerosis. The K2 helps absorb the vitamin D into the bones and prevents this tartar built up. Um, patients who, after they've supplemented for a little while, they really should go get a blood test to see if they're um, appropriate with their levels of vitamin D. And I recommend they stop taking a D supplement about a week before the blood test so that the supplementation of the vitamin D doesn't spike the blood level for the test. Cause then you'll get a false, false reading of what you really are. Um, so other signs and symptoms, um, when you are taking thiamine, that's also called vitamin B1. Uh, if you're, well, excuse me, if you're not taking enough thiamine or not getting enough from fruits and vegetables in your diet, you're going to frequently have a lot of leg cramping or arm hand cramping that happens. Um, could even, you might think it's carpal tunnel. Maybe you're just low and your B1, your, your thiamine levels. Benfoot thiamine is the fat soluble form of vitamin B1. And um, I would take hundred milligrams a day, maybe before bed, uh, you'll wake up feeling more relaxed. If, if you're having these arm and leg cramps um, and sleep disturbances. Um, geographic tongue in the medical community, they teach that that's really a vitamin B deficiency. So we recommend better hygiene, brushing the tongue, there may be a candida problem, taking additional vitamin B, D diet, B diet, <laughs> vitamins, and, um, improving your diet with more fruits and vegetables is helpful. This, uh, angular colitis, um, chapped corners of the lips is a sign of vitamin B2 riboflavin de deficiency. And so you'll also see an increase of migraines, acne, anemia, inflamed GI tract and fatigue. Also wanna mention that one in four American households has a migraine sufferer. And if you're a woman who has migraines um, and if you get the prodromal phase, which means that you see visual and hearing, you have hearing disturbances before the height comes on, you, if you were to get on birth control with migraines with the prodromal phase, you are at an eight times higher risk of stroke uh, than the average person. So if you have a young lady in your chair who's telling you they might, they have migraines and they also are on birth control, it, it might behoove you to, to warn them about that correlation and talk, have them go to talk with their doctor. So a lot of this integrative dentistry concept is about how to support the overall health of the patient and um, work with their doctor or refer them back to the doctor for the answers, but you're just pointing them out because you're seeing oral signs and symptoms of problems. Niacin is the only vitamin B that's got an upper limit, 35 milligrams per day. 
when you first start supplementing with niacin to help with maybe these cholesterol or blood sugar, um, problems, you may start experiencing flushing, which is that feeling you get when you're embarrassed, but just keep working through that. But one of the signs and symptoms of low niacin is going to be, um, pellagra, which is where you have a lot of spotting on the arms or, um, split lips, chronically split lips. Um, I just wanted to connect here, the vitamins and sleep piece, um, vitamins that are very, very helpful when you have enough of them to help you sleep better are going to be iron, magnesium, calcium, vitamin B6, folic acid, vitamin C, vitamin B6, zinc, and magnesium help you sleep a lot better. So B6, we haven't talked about, um, B6. Oh, let's go back to B6. So when you are low on B6, you frequently have a really red fissured tongue. That, that's the key. Um, so I would, when I see that, I don't just say, just go take B6, but you could, you'll, if you, it's really hard to take an excess of B6 as a supplement, you'll pee out basically whatever you don't need, but you're going to get this again from the same kinds of foods, these healthier whole foods, if you want to eat it, um, a sign and symptom of being low in folic acid is gingival recession. So I really hope more of us will connect that and not just say you're brushing too hard. Um, so please notify your patients. They may be low in folic acid when, when you see recession. And if they are MTHFR, again, you want to take a methylated or an, an adenylated form, a form that's sort of pre done where the enzyme work has already been done. Again, 50% of our population's MTHFR. Sign of vitamin B12 deficiency is a very pale tongue, being anemic, being tired. And there's different reasons people can be anemic. But, um, again, if you're taking metformin for diabetes, as millions of Americans are, they can absorb B12 through their, through their stomach. And so those people might take a sublingual, um, a vitamin B capsule that melts under their tongue, or they may need to have a conversation with their doctor. They might do injections or IV treatments. Um, but H2 blockers and PPIs, which also disrupt the gut microbiome, they also deplete magnesium. If you read the, um, fine print for these H2 blockers, they're supposed to go back and talk to their doctor about how to get off of them. So um, I hope more and more people will actually be able to get off of them. A uh, sign and symptom of uh, vitamin C deficiency is, we used to call it scurvy, but bleeding gums. So if you have a patient with a lot of gingivitis, perhaps talk to them about getting on a vitamin C regimen. Magnesium, I call it the $8 solution, talked about it a little earlier, promotes a better night's sleep, helps to absorb your vitamin D from your diet, and it helps um, appropriate ratios of serotonin um, and dopamine in your brain when you sleep. Symptoms of low, of low zinc or brittle nails, hair loss, dry skin, and bad sleep again. So um, also underactive thyroid and inability to smell or taste, which by the way, is also linked to coronavirus. So uh, supplementing with zinc, some people feel is very helpful. They did do a study on Chinese school children about uh, 10 years ago and found that those kids were a lot less likely to develop colds if they chronically supplemented with a zinc compound. Um, so when you're taking synthetic hormones, this is a, a list of vitamins and supplements we might suggest that you consider looking at appropriate amounts of calcium and magnesium also helps with sleep and with building and uh, maintaining bone structure, supplementing to reduce blood pressure. We've kind of touched on this with our chronic uh, heart troubles. And we had a chart that's in your handout, but, um, reducing mouth inflammation through better oral hygiene, fish oil, probiotics, and eating well, like that dietary approaches to stopping hypertension and exercising. Exercising is key uh, supplements for osteoporosis similar to uh, hormone therapy for women. And um, we're, I want to get on sleep, but um, when we're talking about fluoride, um, fluoride competes for iodine um, in the body. And so, because it's a halide chemical as is fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and the body's cell membranes, the tissues that need iodine don't really discriminate between iodine and fluoride. So if you've got somebody with polycystic ovary syndrome, if they have dental fluorosis, um, they have a history of cancer. They have a history of, um, torn ligaments. Those people might do better to, um, supplement with additional iodine. 
BPC-157 is a peptide. You might have heard of peptide therapy. Uh, they started doing peptide therapy back in the 1960s in Russia, but some of this has made it over to the United States. You might talk with a compounding pharmacist in your area because BPC-157 is a peptide that has been uh, studied and shown to help control inflammation. So if you're somebody with gum disease, you might ask uh, your compounding pharmacist how you might help them if you're looking for additional solutions to deal with gum disease about taking that peptide. It can be injected, um, the patient can inject at home um, or they might even have it put into a toothpaste. The toothpaste is a little pricey. I wanted to talk about emotional health and meridians. Um, two thirds of the world or a lot of it, all the people that live over here um, believe there's a connection between um, meridians, emotions and teeth. And um, they study, um, for instance, this is the gallbladder meridian. If you have an ankle problem, it can actually be manifested as additional jaw pain. And this is why, because when you strip, they've done um, dissections of the human body. Um, it's like when you peel chicken off of a bone, it, the meat tears a certain way, the fascia strips off the bone a certain way. And so this is how we can make these connections between you know, something going on, a foot problem, and additional grinding or clenching around the mouth um, and a history of an injury. This is the small intestine channel and you'll see um, connections with the masseter and sternocleidomastoid. mastoid. Um, a lot of times, uh, this is Dr. Jimmy Willeman. He's been one of my teachers, he's out of Australia. He attributes a lot of these um, adaptations, why we're having so many troubles with jaws sometimes to our modern lifestyle, holding a computer mouse and typing and hun being hunched over a screen. It's not a natural way to be. So encouraging people to exercise and eat well is, is a helpful way to prevent some of these uh, muscle knots that can occur. Um, and the, this is showing those connections between um, the meridians and certain teeth. The teeth in some ways, in other cultures, it's taught that the teeth are like a circuit board. Um, and it's through these fascial lines when you do these dissections that you get this type of relationship happening. And um, Dr. Dietrich Klinghart, um, he's out of Europe. He's done some um, studies showing how when you're missing certain teeth, um, they've done studies in geriatric populations. They find that there's actually connections between like missing certain teeth and experiencing additional grief. And this could also come with age because these studies have been done in geriatric populations. But I will say that on a personal note, um, during the coronavirus shutdown, um, every patient that I would have to come in for, for a major emergency, um, and they would have um, an issue with one of their molars where it would be abscessed all of a sudden, um, every, I started, it just got to be a habit. I started asking them, have you had a death in your family? And every single one of them had had a passing of a parent, um, not necessarily from coronavirus, but during that time of the shutdown. So, um, sometimes if you dare to ask the questions, you know, are you experiencing anxiety? You might be surprised because of a, of a, of a toothache, you might be surprised, uh, what the answers are. So I, I want you to dare to have the conversations, Adverse childhood experiences. Um, when you've the studies show it's a it's a ten question questionnaire on the internet. It's things like um, I saw one parent hit another. One of my parents was jailed. One of my parents was um, an alcoholic. Um, children, when they have these experiences as a young person, studies show that even 40 years later, they have more trouble sleeping. It may be that they have more trouble taking care of themselves because they could have been a caretaker in their family, but we see higher levels of inflammatory chemicals, the same ones that we see with gut dysbiosis, the C-reactive protein levels being upped, the interleukin-2 and interleukin-6 levels being upped when they've had adverse childhood experiences. So we had this slide earlier and I wanted to reconnect that. And then I want to spend the last few minutes talking about oral sleep appliances with our patients. Um, when we develop the face with our new functional dental appliances that are out on the market, and there's a lot of different tools that we can use in our toolbox, we can help correct um, some of these troubles that we've seen that are linked to oral sleep apnea. We might use a laser to do a tongue tie clipping. Um, we might help expand a palate. And now we have greater room with the facial development of the maxilla and the bringing forward of the mandible. So we have less incidence of the scalloped tongue. We realize that 85% of oral sleep apnea is undiagnosed and the dental office can do sleep testing. Most in most of our states, just to, actually all of our states, um, some states, Georgia, where I'm from is one of the states where we need a medical doctor to sign off that the patient's getting sleep tested at the dental office. We don't do it at the office. We send patients home with a take-home test. 
And you can be a doc connector, um, work with your local ENTs. It, this is maybe not even a dental appliance that's most appropriate for the patient. It could be that um, it could be they need a CPAP, but patients that have a CPAP, which has been the gold standard for sleep apnea, um, if they have asthma or um, a lot of fluid, chronic pulmonary um, uh, dysbiosis or um, barrel shaped lungs, they actually are not good candidates for a sleep app for a CPAP. They would do better with an oral appliance. Um, when you have oral sleep apnea, you have the same increased inflammation load of these same inflammatory chemicals. We see increased rates of ob obesity, insulin resistance, and hypertension and sympathetic nervous system activation. Um, a hundred years ago in the literature, we didn't see an anterior open bite that we see now. Um, so these things can be corrected with these oral functional orthodontic appliances. We see with our latest technology, the cone beam x-ray, an opening up of the airway when we work with these types of appliances. Oral myofunctional therapy can also be an adjunct. Um, I work with a team of people. Sometimes it's a doctor, sometimes it's chiropractors, and sometimes a myofunctional therapist. And this is, happens to be one of my own daughters, three months after just doing myofunctional therapy. No oral appliance at all, but you'll see her face is really developing. And at this age, she's about 12 years old. Um, but uh, we find that oral myofunctional therapy helps the patient eat better. They're able to distribute food more evenly amongst the oral surfaces of the teeth. And you're going to get a greater development of the maxilla. We also see an improve, uh, not an improvement in the TMJ joint, but a reduction in muscle pain. And an, a moral myofunctional therapist is really like having a personal trainer for the mouth. Tongue tie release, we use a laser. This is a marathon runner that I see. And about seven months later, he's got a higher heart rate variability, which is supported with medical literature. When you clip a, a very highly tied tongue, tongue's gonna look like a strawberry at the tip. And you'll see this so-called heart line and Chinese medicine. Um, when you have that, you're more likely to have anxiety and um, eventually heart, some heart trouble from the anxiety, they say. So um, this is my big personal why. One of my daughters, very small face, uh, wanted to play violin, um, but had a lot of anxiety and um, attention issues early on in school. Helped get my start. We connected um, some of the anxiety um, to tongue placement. When you get that tongue against the roof of the mouth, you're able to ramp up that parasympathetic nervous system when the patient swallows, de decrease the sympathetic nervous system. Osteocranial therapy, cranial sacral therapy. This is what this looks like. This is my colleague, Dr. Arlene Diamko, can also be an adjunct way to open up um, the lymphatic flow, uh, relieve. Um, symptoms from an old birth trauma or a concussion. And um, so I'm just saying, work with people in your, in your community, get to know the doctors in your community, consider using these oral sleep apnea appliances. I use a lot of off therapy um, in our practice. And um, this is just five months into treatment on a 35 year old woman. We're getting advancement uh, or an, a widening of the dental arch and um, this is another patient. We're doing another type of appliance, uh, for oral functional orthodontic appliance on, and we're getting an increase in the airway. And this is that same patient that you saw the increase in airway. You get a development of the maxilla. We do this on children as well. This was a child with pandas or hearing aids was in special needs classes. And two years later is done in mainstream school. Now no hearing aids increasing the nitric oxide pathway or storage ability in the maxillary sinus. This is on a 79 year old patient. We're getting growth of the airway and our ability to stand up more straight, better posture, 11 months into treatment. And so I just want to encourage you the five conversations, um, teaching good healthcare numbers, appreciating gene snips. And that's my alarm because we're supposed to be done explaining the, and appreciating the relationships between emotional and dental health talking about diet and lifestyle, talking about sleep with your patients, leaning close in to make that personal experience and connection with the person in, before you, it is going to help you grow your practice. You're joining the future of dentistry. We're supporting our medical practitioners. Patients going to get more consistent, better care. They're going to value their appointment. Your practice is going to grow. It's exciting. It's an exciting time. I think it's going to be the new golden age of dentistry. And I also just want to finish up by saying, um, in the words of Thomas Edison, 
The doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest his patients in the care of the human frame, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. So I appreciate it. My uh, daughter, my personal story, uh, she became a violinist like she wanted to do. And I thought, oh my gosh, how is she ever going to focus? And she was featured on an NBC um, ad for Atlanta Irish Fest a couple of years ago. And um, so these are the five conversations to have. Thank you for watching. Amy Dairies is my name. I'm out of Atlanta. Feel free to reach out to me if you'd like to. And um, blessings and good health to all of you out there. Thank you.